Možete mi reći samo kolege iz video prijenosa kada počinje, kad vam ja dam znak, jel? Live. Dobro. Poštovani gosti u Velikoj dvorani novinarskog doma, poštovani svi koji nas gledate online preko YouTube kanala Gonga, dobrodošli na, a ja moram reći, danas vjerojatno najvažniju konferenciju u Evropi na ovu temu, jer sam gledala drugih nema obzirom na snagu našeg prvog i drugog panela. To je ovaj činjenica. A fact. So, European perspectives, the impact of this information on the health of democracy and digital environment, burning issue of today, we have top-notch experts in the field from all around Europe, northeast, west and south, core policy-making, decision-making, uh, journalists, practitioners, uh, university. And I will give at the beginning floor to Oriana Ivković Nogmet, Executive Director of GONG, to greet us before we start, please. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this GONG and ProFX conference, European Perspectives. My name is uh, Oriana Ivković Novokmet. I'm executive director of GONG. First of all, I would like to greet all representatives of the institutions who are here or who will be here with us from the government office for the cooperation with NGOs, vice president of Zagreb City Council, all representatives from Ministry of Culture and Media, Ministry of Economy, representatives from independent bodies, agencies, ambassador of Finland and representatives from Sweden, embassy. And I just want to say that GONG as Croatian and uh, European democracy watchdog, we care about the health of liberal democracy. And we know that internet and social networks hold the potential for better civic engagement, but also, as we have learned, could undermine and hijack our democracies. We want to build society resistant to manipulation, disinformation, stealing our data, surveillance, election interference, as well as strongly regulate big tech platforms. We witness a new era in big tech regulation, but we want a more narrow imbalance between people and big tech. We advocate together with other European organization and initiative for better, for more democratic internet, for internet, for the citizens. I'm happy today that we have speakers and experts from all over Europe, from Poland, Czech, Lithuania, Germany, Italy, of course, and Croatia, to share their valuable knowledge, to share their experiences with us, and to try to find improvement of democracy, digital environment, and journalism. I just um, want to say that we have video message from the Vera Jourova, Mrs. Vera Jourova, Vice President of European Commission and Commissioner for Transparency and Values. She wanted to greet us to this conference. She couldn't be here, so she sent us some kind of message with your support. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Of our fundamental with a focus on 
The digital revolution has brought new opportunities for our democracies, but also new threats. The COVID-19 pandemic accelerated this trend and made the challenges more acute. The Russian invasion of Ukraine highlighted once more the need for prompt actions to strengthen the resilience of our democracies and address vulnerabilities. The EU response to these important challenges is taking place in the framework of the European Democracy Action Plan. The Action Plan includes measures to strengthen media freedom and pluralism, alongside measures targeted to fight disinformation and to ensure free and fair elections. And we are responding to the challenge in the European way with a focus on collaboration and transparency and in full respect of our fundamental rights and freedoms. We deliver on this plan. Last September, the Commission presented recommendations to Member States to improve the safety of journalists. Most recently, we adopted a package to address strategic lawsuits against journalists, so-called slaps. And it is essential that journalists and human rights defenders are afforded the necessary space, including to counter disinformation and other manipulative interference in the democratic debate. More so, we are working on a new proposal, the Media Freedom Act, to protect the pluralism and the independence of the media. Media should be able to operate without pressure, whether public or private. The European Democracy Action Plan complements a set of regulations that and the Wild West in the Internet, and that brings back basic responsibility and accountability in the online space, especially to the large tech companies. With the Digital Services Act, we have fundamental rules on the way intermediaries participate in the distribution of online content. We also need clear rules for political campaigns, because as they move increasingly online, we cannot allow political debate to become the unchecked race of dirty methods. The Commission's proposal for a regulation on the transparency of political advertising provides for a high standard of transparency for political advertising in the EU and limits the use of opaque targeting and amplification methods of such messages. But we also believe we cannot and should not regulate everything. This is particularly true when it comes to the fight against disinformation, because we have to be very careful not to undermine the freedom of speech. We do not want to create a ministry of truth. At the same time, we cannot stay idle as disinformation poses a substantial and ongoing threat to democracy. It can be used to divide the public, to manipulate or attack the legitimacy of democratic institutions. The war in Ukraine and the information manipulation linked to it is a recent example of the big threat. And it is not the only one. We have also seen it during the COVID pandemic. Dangerous messages, misleading healthcare information, and organized propaganda campaigns have also been used to sow division, instill fear, exploit citizens, and even put their lives at risk. We will not delete our way out of the problem. A centerpiece of our efforts to fight disinformation has been the self-regulatory code of practice on disinformation, a first-of-its-kind effort worldwide, bringing together industry to commit to voluntary standards to counter disinformation and risks stemming from its dissemination. We are now working to overhaul the code and add new players to it. 
the new code will include a much more detailed set of commitments from online platforms to fight online disinformation and a stricter monitoring system. Together, the Digital Services Act and the new code will establish a co-regulatory framework for addressing systemic risks to democracy that information manipulation and disinformation on platform services present. This is an important period in the Union's efforts to shape how we make our democracies resilient and adapt our societies to the digital age. It is also a matter of trust for citizens in the digital transition. Thank you and have a great discussion. of AI-ish voice that we heard, but I would like also to welcome Ivana Kekin, Vice President of Zagreb City Assembly, who will greet us at the beginning. Good day. Yeah, here. So first I want to apologize. I wasn't aware that I should prepare my speech in English, so it's in Croatian, but uh, I believe there is a translation available. Um, dakle, poštovane dame i gospodo, poštovani organizatori današnje konferencije, uh, iznimna mi je čast da vas mogu pozdraviti u ime gradonačelnika Tomislava Tomaševića, ali i u svoje osobno ime. Dakle, držim da je tema ove konferencije stvarno iznimno važna, da informacije, mediji, medijska pismenost usko su vezani uz zdravlje, dakle, uz zdravlje u širem smislu, dakle, zdravlje naše javne komunikacije, zdravlje demokracije, ali vidjeli smo u proteklih dvije godine da su usko vezani i uz individualno zdravlje pojedinaca. Dojma sam da, iako niti dezinformacije, niti teorije zavjere nisu neka novost, da su zaista u posljednje dvije i pol godine pokazale jedan zastrašujući, zastrašujući intenzitet, kakav do sada zapravo i nismo imali priliku vidjeti. I činjenica je da je potreban razgovor o tome kako se boriti protiv toga. Vidimo da je i medijski ekosustav izuzetno ugrožen, Dakle, da imamo situaciju gdje su mediji pod um, i političkim i financijskim pritiscima, gdje rade u jednom clickbait tempu i zapravo teško odoljevaju um, uh, u tom natjecanju sa dezinformacijama koje nam se javljaju po društvenim medijima. S te strane, razgovor o tome kako ojačati medije, kako ojačati uh, njihovu ulogu da uh, donose nepristrane i uh, dakle, uh, točne prije svega informacije, kako um, ojačati, um, odnosno um, um, izboriti se protiv situacije koju smo često vidjeli ove dvije godine gdje se uh, u principu pa i u medijima uh, uh, stavovi temeljeni na činjenicama kao i stavovi temeljeni na uh, krivim informacijama, na lažima, predstavljaju kao dva jednako vrijedna stava samo sa dva pola, kako izbjeći to u budućnosti, uh, to su velika pitanja i ja vjerujem da će i ova konferencija približiti nas barem odgovorima. Hvala vam na tome. Hvala puno Ivan Kekin. I prije nego što počnemo sa našim prvim panelom, imamo još jednu video poruku profesora Nebojš Reblanoše koji nije mogao doći s nama. On je također dio ovog velikog pro fakt projekta profesor sa Fakulteta političkih znanosti. Poslušajmo. Dear friends and colleagues, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this conference which deals with the impact of disinformation on the health of democracy and the digital media. My name is Nevoj Šablanuša. I'm a professor of political psychology at the Faculty of Political Science, University of Zagreb, and research coordinator of the ProFact project here in Croatia, which deals with uh, studying, researching, debunking, and educating about COVID-19 disinformation and conspiracy theories. I hope you will have a pleasant time here in Zagreb as well as successful work. And I'm very sorry that I'm not with you because I'm currently at the study trip with my students, graduate students, 
uh, where we are dealing with the sites of cultural traumas from the mid and late 20th century here in the Balkans. Maybe that could look as a distant past for you and especially in terms of digital media. But what we are dealing here at our study trip, but also you at this conference, uh, is, I would say, very important. Why? What is here, like a past of the 20th century in the Balkans and our present, is probably Ukrainian future on a much larger scale. And media were involved in all these traumas, in their, you know, preparation, instigation, arson, I would even say. For that reason, I think that your job here in Zagreb is even more important. Thank you very much. So our first panel, regulating big tech as a vaccine against disinformation. I'm very happy and honored and thrilled, basically, that we have such a panel. I'll start with our guest. Uh, uh, first, you know, gender parity. We're better, three to two. That's a good start. Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy that I can welcome Dorota Glavatska from Panopticon Foundation, Google, and you'll see how much of important work they're doing. Welcome, Dorota. Uh, Mariana Gerbesha, Faculty of Political Science, Zagreb, and Profect. Who doesn't know her? Your loss. Welcome. Uh, Lauri Tierala. Uh, in times where we heard Vera Jourova saying that basically it's Commission's strategic focus, this information, the work of your organization, which is European Digital Media Observatory, it's EDMO as an acronym which is working uh, under the auspices basically in the European University Institute School of Transitional Governance in Florence, uh, is of utmost importance, so welcome. And last but not least, uh, concerning the, the, the framework also we heard about core regulative uh, on our subject is Jan Penfrat from European Digital Rights Initiative. Welcome. Uh, so my first kind of, I wouldn't say a provocation, a question to you all. We heard there's a wild west out there. We know it's a war after the pandemic. We see various layers of cognitive dissonances influencing um, and we see that two of legal or I don't know how to call them mechanisms that were being presented by the Commission are first code of practice and disinformation and second uh, which we heard the DSA. So uh, I would like to ask you all uh, to what extent these two contains a cure to this information, what Dorota positioned at her, as her point, uh, or where can we go from here? Because things are accelerating so fast that I think we cannot act how fast things are going beside the legislative or, or you know, concrete action on the ground. I will start with Jan. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, let me be provocative back. Uh, the internet is not a wild west. Um, for me, that's a catchphrase um, that politicians use to justify why regulation is needed. And yes, regulation is needed, but that doesn't mean it's a wild west. The wild west was characterized by a lack of, a, a, a lack of laws, so lawlessness, basically. And that's not true. And another one of these political phrases that you often hear is what is illegal offline must also be illegal online, and that's why we need X, Y, Z. Um, already today, everything that is illegal offline is already illegal online. Of course it is. Um, you don't need a specific law for that. But the question is, how do we enforce it? Because enforcement works very different offline than it works online. And I think in, in terms of enforcement, um, we've, we've failed in the past. Also, as you say, the development has been so fast. Um, and so I think things like the Digital Services Act and also the Code of Practice for Disinformation, these things are um, attempts to improve enforcement. Um, they don't 
even create new things that are illegal now all of a sudden that haven't been illegal before. Like on the illegal, illegality front, everything stays the same. Uh, so we can continue with this, but upgrade it. Uh, the enforcement, you said, is the key issue and enforcement in terms of those who are the owners of the platforms, who are global, who are big tech, who are not under, let's say, European jurisdiction, uh, taxations, more or less. You will explain that, of course. Uh, Interesting picture we saw after uh, Elon Musk announced this 45 billion offer, still an offer. Uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton flew to the States and after his initial tweet that uh, it's good that we have DSA now in Europe, he said that um, basically he and Elon are completely aligned that what Musk is proposing, it's exactly what European Commission stands for. So how do we... Uh, enforce it or uh, um, what do we do in this kind of situation with you know Musk from one side and for example China because I can say for the example here uh, how huge TikTok influence is and if we look to our perspective to European elections 2024 the impact of the platform owned by China is immense on the voter base on various sides, so how would you add to the Jan's point? Dorota, or whoever wants to take it. Uh, honestly, when I found out that Elon Musk uh, is planning to take over uh, Twitter, I kind of felt a little bit more secure um, having in mind that uh, we have the DSA coming, because for me it was pretty clear that as long as we have a robust regulation, to what extent a DSA is robust regulation, that's a matter for a, I would say, um, deeper discussion that we may have in a minute. Um, but still, it provides some sort of guarantees that make me feel more secure in the sense that it's less important who owns the platform as long as um, there are robust enforceable regulations in place. So, um, and to be honest with you, we very much took advantage of the fact that Elon Musk um, announced uh, Twitter's acquisition uh, just to basically talk to people about the DSA because like, even though we've been working on that file for over past two years now, it uh, did not uh, receive... Excuse me, uh, last row please, it's very acoustic, the room, so if you can spare us your conversation, thank you, sorry, Dr. It has not received, um, I would say, very. Uh, it has not, has not received a lot of media or public's opinions attention so far. Um, so uh, yeah, so we took. A, so we how to empower the, uh, what you said? This is the regulation and enforcement. But another thing is us, because we are tackled by it. So how to empower? all of the users with this frameworks or with other mechanisms because we are not seeing it and I will pick up with Edmo and Mariana on that you know how they understand how much influenced they are so, so let me uh, like briefly introduce DSA to those who are not familiar with the regulation um, it basically deals with various aspects of how online uh, intermediaries function but the most uh, far-fetched revolutionary to some extent, uh, in some other areas a bit disappointing, uh, but, but still the most far-fetched changes it brings uh, concern the regulation of biggest platforms. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and basically big, uh, big tech companies. And uh, in this regard, it, I believe it brings some answers that will help us, meaning citizens, address the problem of disinformation that I very much associate with how platforms function, which again is very much linked to the, their current business model. Uh, what I want to stress is that our focus when we think of disinformation is not to identify, track, um, punish bad actors who spread disinformation. We focus solely on the role of, on, role of platforms in this regard. And their role is not neutral they contribute, by the way they function, they contribute very much to the amplification of different kinds of harmful content, including disinformation. So um, citizens will be empowered um, in the sense that they will, for example, know more of how 
algorithms that are used for um, content curation work. And what we know about them so far is that the way they work, again, very much contributes to amplifying content that generates um, engagement. Um, and therefore, often, they do not promote valuable content with um, authentic informative value. But what they promote is often um, content that has no value and at the same time can be harmful, for example, disinforming. Thank Not you. only that, but that's one of the examples. So wow. pe people will, uh, what people know, they will know more of how of these algorithms work. My biggest regret is that people will not get a meaningful power to influence the logic of those algorithms. They will get some power to, um, they, they will have some powers over it. They will, they will be able to, um, for example, change uh, the way their um, recommender systems works to some extent, but only uh, to a very limited um, stage. Uh, thank you. Lauri, I want you to pick next, and maybe if we are you know, clarifying the, the, the names and the codes, uh, you can tell us what's code of practice and this information in this regard. Sure, thanks, for, thanks a lot for, for having me. If you allow me to take one st step very briefly back, uh, look at the word disinformation. What, what my coll colleague here said, that what's illegal offline is already illegal online as well. And that's obviously true, as, as you said. But that's exactly the, the problem, that the word disinformation covers a lot of things that are actually not illegal, whether it's created for, for financial gain or, or for political purposes or just for whatever ever reason. So we are, we are working in some, something of a gray zone, and I think it's a very European approach, sorry for using this commission, commission ex expression, not to try to regulate every, everything. And there I think that the multi-stakeholder approach of collaboration of taking everyone on, on board and co-regulation is probably the, the, the wise move. Whether the details are right, whether the ESA is strong enough, whether the re renewed code of practice, I will get into that in a, in a second, is strong enough, that's another question, but philosophically I, I do agree with, with the approach. The code of practice on disinformation negotiated between the, basically the biggest online, online platforms and the commission, the first version is, is now, has been there since 2018 and, well, obviously has not been strong enough. The final negotiations about the renewed code are, are ongoing, just renew received the invitation to one, one more meeting on, on, on Monday to, to listen to, and I think it's in the very, very final phases. It's not Edmo's job to, to judge, because it's, it's, we are not party to the negotiations. We've, been, we've had the opportunity to follow them, but it's obvious that it will be a much stronger instrument than the current one has been. And of course, the key here is implementation, whether there are indicators and monitoring that the platforms are actually delivering on the commitments they make in the, in the code of practice. That's the key. I think two excellent points, implementations and monitoring. We'll get uh, to that in the next round, also with explanation of EDMO and national hubs, which are being created all over Europe. But I want to ask Mariana, what are we going to do uh, now? Because we set the scene, we have this framework, but we don't want to regulate much. So where are we? Yes, Just a yes. Um, yes um, a lot has been already said about uh, the code and the Digital Services Act, which are two really important frameworks, not only and philosophies, as you said, not only uh, documents and the new code of practice obviously is going to, is trying to uh, cope with the insufficiencies and uh, the, the the problems of uh, the, the the upgraded code is trying to tackle the problems and the fact that basically um, platforms are, for example, still not very transparent about the moderation of the content and these are some of the problems of the implementation of the code. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize here, it's not only regulation, it's also building the resilience of um, 
uh, societies in general to disinformation. So it's basically about engaging um, uh, different stakeholders and it basically comes to education, um, to literacy, and to uh, building the capacity of the media to resist disinformation. That's very important. And I think uh, regulation alone um, will do a, a lot, but cannot resolve the issue of disinformation. And you can see already that there are differences within different societies and how they cope with disinformation, depending on the level of their um, political culture and the strength of their media system, for example. And I think uh, that's a huge topic that societies such as Croatia and uh, Southeastern Europe in general uh, need to really um, focus on. So I'm very happy about the projects such as um, European Digital Media Observatory because I think that's uh, a real huge step forward. And um, also with the uh, raised awareness in countries such as ours about the importance of uh, fact-checking projects and about the importance as, of um, education projects um, re uh, related to disinformation. So I think that's something that needs to go hand-in-hand uh, hand with, uh, with uh, regulation. Otherwise, um, the awareness about what's being done and um, about the, as you said, it's not, the problem with this information is that not everything and most of it is not illegal. That's the thing. So fake news is, that's why the term fake news has been abandoned because basically uh, only um, um, a minority of the problems is actually fake news, but uh, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, these are the problems we are dealing with. So it's a, uh, it's a really uh, distorted, manipulated um, um, presentation of the problems and um, construction of society that we are dealing with. So that's my point basically, building the, 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 the strength, the resilience of societies, that should be really the goal uh, uh, besides basically um, regulation of course. So it's fundamentals, someone mentioned philosophy, so we're, we're you know, really tackling the, the basic philosophy and sociology and politics of us as society. So I'm going back to Jan, in terms of what you know, EDRI is uh, doing as you know, European Digital Rights Initiative and empowering of, of people to, to, I don't know, try to understand and want to understand because uh, what you said, implementation and monitoring, we cannot rely on states. The world functions as one global platform through these platforms. So how do we plunge into this philosophy of us through big, created through big tech? I don't know how to you know, frame it, thanks. Um, it's a big question. Uh, it's, it's very hard to answer. Um, I, 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 f I fully agree with, with what Mariana said. It, this is much more than just a tech problem, and it's much, it can't be solved with regulation alone. We need to educate um, whole generations of people um, about how to deal with this immense amount of information that we have at our disposal right now to be able to sort um, the useful information from the fails information um, or just, yeah. And, and I think this is, yeah, more than just a, just a tech problem. It's more than just a, um, a regulatory problem. Um, but I think it's, it's important to see and to acknowledge that, that policymakers are trying to build a framework which allows people to, um, to live in and to, which helps us to shape an information environment which allows people to actually make these choices. Uh, and I think this is what both the, the Code of Practice but also the Digital Services Act are trying to do, establish this kind of content governance framework um, for the whole of the EU. Um, now, have they done it right? Um, I think time will tell. There are a couple of really good things in there, um, that's for sure. Um, but it also has its limitations. And one of the things that we at ADRI have been focusing on a lot is to help, like to, foc to focus the debate on the systemic problems that we see in the platform economy. Because a lot of the problems that we're seeing, in particular with disinformation, but also other types of problematic content, is that the problem isn't that someone is lying on the internet. People have been lying since. Well, forever. since people have been around, right, since forever. And, um, and so all in a sudden the problem appears because we gave everyone in the world the power to broadcast to everyone else 24-7 for free. That has never been done before. 
we've never been at that point, so we don't know how to deal with this. Freedom of speech is basically bigger than ever, in a way, um, for, for many people. Um, and so how, how do we deal with the people who abuse this, this new one freedom um, is, is one of the big questions. But also, how is the speech that people make, uh, that people produce, then amplified afterwards? And I, I very much like what Dorota was saying about the importance of how algorithms are governed. Why is it that our public debate is entirely, almost entirely happening on one or two or three big platforms that are run by, by multi-billion dollar companies based in Silicon Valley? Um, and they, they call the shots, they decide how our public speech is happening today, how our political debates are happening today. These platforms that we're using, like Facebook, like Twitter, um, like Instagram, they haven't even been built to host polit political or public debates. They've never been thought to, to fulfill this role, and now we're just using it for it. They're actually advertising platforms, um, and that's what they're being built for, that's what they're being um, optimized for. So I think if you really want to tackle this problem in the long run, we need more than just content governance. We will need to think about what kind of online platforms, what kind of um, systems, technologies do we need to build to, uh, to actually have a healthy public debate? Um, because I think Facebook is not it. Super input. Thanks, Jan. Uh, and now we come to Edmo, because you were inaugurated basically from above <laughs> as uh, something that was seeing that it's needed in a sense. Uh, but I really don't think we are all familiar uh, because we are in the subject. But for the citizens, for the users, for the guys influenced, for all the people who vote at the end of the election, uh, how do you assist them, help them, or help governments? And uh, why do you think these national hubs like daughters of and sons of Edmo are important? Language, of course. But... Thank, thank you. I th thought I could begin with the, you know, the official adverti advertisement speech of what Edmo is. I'll do it a bit later in a very, very, very short, short way and, and begin with the unofficial analysis that, as you said earlier, disinformation is one of the priorities for, for the European Commission, for the European politeia, if, if you will, at, at the moment. And uh, Edmo is a one 30-month total project, receiving a couple of millions of, of euros for a consortium of five partners. So obviously there is a discrepancy between these two statements. <laughs> And, and we, all, we all, all see that, but it's a start. I, I, I think it's a it's an start with a lot of promise in, in it. In, indeed, we we are a, a, here's the official part. We are a platform bringing together fact checkers and media literacy practitioners and and, and disinformation researchers. St started less than than two, two, two years ago. Now the, with eight national or regional hubs, hope to cover almost all of EU, if not the whole EU, by, the, by early, early next, uh, next year, since the call for new hubs was closed quite some, some time ago, and we're expecting decisions. Our job is to create the tools for the hundred plus, or actually hundreds of different players in all around Europe working to collaborate and to create something bigger than, than each of us can individually do. But easier said than done, it's about institution building. It doesn't happen in, in six months or, or 12 months. Now we're, of course, uh, the current term of, of Edmo run, runs until, until November this year, and we are, of course, hope, hoping to continue the project. And then in the medium and long term, I think this is, if this is deemed as the right way to, to cooperate in the fight against disinformation in, in Europe, I think then we will need to jointly on a political level decide to, to what, what kind of a structure is needed in Europe. Uh, Obviously, short-term project is not that. Uh, our second panel is basically uh, called how to enhance democracy by strengthening the media ecosystem. Of course, those subjects overlap. Uh, we can talk also about that, but I will leave it to the second panel not to take much of uh, uh, their content. Uh, but uh, going back to Dorota, 
uh, I really would like from you to hear basically to what extent, for example, DSA uh, could be, you, you've mentioned some things, but you know, could be used to support professional quality media and spread of credible news because when we are discussing these things in you know, journalist circles, we kind of say maybe it's, you know, time of media is past because what Jan said, everyone can broadcast today, but it's time for journalism to collaboration, to cross, uh, I don't know, to, to public uh, financing of, of, of content and credibility uh, because that people lack in this wood uh, where you cannot see a tree. So maybe what are your pickups from that and I would also really like to hear some, if you have, this preliminary results uh, that Panopticum and Global Witness did uh, on this information around war in Ukraine in Poland. And we can then go into the last ring of your ideas for us. Sure, I'll try to be brief on, on both issues, um, which will be challenging. Um, starting with media, and DSA. Um, I believe it very much goes along with what was already said that um, disinformation is a multidisciplinary problem and therefore like no regulation is a silver bullet solution to it. So for me uh, it's kind of clear that we need a lot of different things to uh, try to be able effective, uh, effectively address disinformation and one of these things are strong, independent, credible media. Um, and uh, it's also pretty clear that we need some regulatory changes in order to um, empower those actors. And one of the uh, reasons for that is that um, those platforms that we've already mentioned, the big ones, that when they were created, I believe many uh, journalists and in, in general media uh, sector people believed that they will bring a positive change to media landscape in the sense that they will um, allow media to reach wider towards their audience, that they will be tools that will allow journalists to um, uh, reach more people with their content. This unfortunately turned out to be a huge disappointment because instead of empowerment, uh, we ended up with a situation where media are actually in a hostage, hostage situation. They are very much dependent on big platforms and they lost something that they have controlled for years and decades, meaning control over distribution of their news. Uh, before, uh, I would say, online era, they were very much in charge of how their content was distributed. Right now, it's actually the platforms who contribute how, um, sorry, who control how the news content is distributed. Uh, there are like multiple studies confirming that social media is currently the most popular channel via which people actually access news. Um, and it's very much controlled by the platforms in the sense that they do their own content moderation. So, for example, they remove content. And there are like multiple examples when media content, perfectly uh, legitimate uh, media content, has been removed. For example, very, very um, uh, widely discussed case of uh, removal of so called Napalm Girl photo. Um, that was published by one of the uh, Norwegian dailies uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but what I think is even more uh, meaningful um, is the so-called threat of invisibility that uh, media are facing uh, on the platforms. So um, uh, the threat that they can keep using the platforms, but they never know who they reach. And unfortunately, we have more and more evidence suggesting that what people get in the first place is not really a valuable media content. But um, like as I said before, content that has nothing to do with credibility and trustworthiness and, uh, and, and informative value. So uh, to what extent DSA addresses it? I believe that there are some solutions that may that media may benefit from. For example, um, 
the like due diligence standards regarding content moderation and the possibility to, for example, more effectively than today, question the removal decisions. So like imagine that like when you have a media and your fa uh, f Facebook fan page is an important way through which you reach your readers. Unfortunately, you may like it, you may disagree with it. I think we should do something about it, but it is what it is uh, at the moment. So once you lose this um, fan page, it may really, um, it may have impact on your readership. Um, so uh, DSA to some extent gives a answer to this by uh, providing those due diligence standards and appeals, more fair appeals processes for people who got blocked on the platform. What it does not address is this threat of uh, invisibility. Uh, the platforms, as I said before, still regain power over um, how their algorithms um, recommend content to people. We leave uh, the, the, your, your research for later. I want to ask uh, Mariana and Jan uh, and uh, Lauri on, you know, is big tech media, Elon Musk is, as Mariana put it very well once, said, you know, uh, Musk and his freedom of speech absolutism. So that is also something that we lost in this sense. What is media? What is, you know, big tech? What is there in terms of, you know, content and understanding of today? Yes, that's, that's how he identifies himself as a media, uh, media a f a free speech absolutist. So whatever it means, we're going to find out, I think. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, I think that's one of the questions, um, uh, what, what's, what's, uh, what's, what's the media today and who are the journalists and uh, what's the news today? So I think, uh, I think um, Jan mentioned uh, new generations and I think that's the problem that we are going to see in the, in the countries that do not invest in media literacy, digital literacy that younger generations, they do not recognize uh, a news as a genre, as, as we know it. So they do not know the difference between the news and any other content on the internet. So we are going to face, uh, we'll have to face the fact that, uh, um, that the, the creators, uh, content creators, so influencers, are becoming new journalists for, uh, for, the, for the younger generations. So when I asked my students where do they uh, pick up their news about Ukraine, so most of them said TikTok. So they're not picking them up from journalists, they are picking them up from uh, the people or even more often from personalities. So from TikTok personalities, meaning different kinds of celebrities and influencers. So I think that's something that we should really ser seriously think about. And that's uh, about your questions, uh, not only what's the media, but who are the, what's the news and what are, who are the sources of news for younger generations. And I think that's a really important question. And then we go back again to media literacy and uh, the, the need to educate um, uh, younger, younger generations. But uh, about the media, just very briefly, and mainstream media. So um, I think, uh, and I think the position of the media here is that they are uh, the victims, obviously, of the whole digitalization process and the uh, disinformation, um, the beast of disinformation, but also they are partners in crime, and that has been confirmed in many, many studies. So uh, what we need here is really uh, the work on um, uh, strengthening the independence of the media uh, and freedom of the media, but also um, to somehow try to work on the phenom phenomenon of the professionalization of the media and journalism, which has been happening in, in many countries because of primarily digitalization and this imperative of speed, uh, attention economy, uh, economic pressures, etc. So um, I think that the issue of the role of media and the whole this um, disinformation um, a story is very important because, as you know, the trumpet of um, 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 amplifier trumpet has basically is a really nice illustration how disinformation becomes the most powerful once it's picked up by the, the media. So. Uh, if we talk strategically, European Union doesn't have its own Google, doesn't have its own Meta doesn't have its own globally influential AI. 
infrastructure company or R&D in that regard that you know both China and US are competing in. Uh, second line of this strategic question is aligned with what we're experiencing right now and this is you know us versus them so democracy versus autocracy uh, and how can they work in different manner which we saw through influence digital influencing uh, you've mentioned uh, several cases we can talk about you know from brexit to poland campaign in abortion rights whatever uh, so you know do we have strategic thinking and do we have consensus because it's still EU Council so the nation states having the last call on these kind of decisions which are huge my first reaction was well thank God we don't have a European meta then we'd have another one of those problems I mean yeah, yeah. we're just talking about how how problematic these platforms are and then people ask why don't we have the same thing in Europe well we shouldn't have um, if we already have to rebuild alternative digital infrastructure for our online communications then let's do it better um, let's do it decentralized let's do it privacy preserving let's do it um, under the control of the people rather than under the control of a handful of billionaires um, and so I think we, c we can benefit from having this well, let's call it maybe the second mover advantage so we can learn from from Silicon Valley's mistakes um, and and build a better infrastructure um, that's for one. I, maybe, if I can, a quick note on the, the, the weakness and the problems of journalism, of which I'm totally not an expert uh, of. Um, so thanks for all the comments that you already made, Mariana. But I just, on, on top of what Dorota said, um, I think when, the, when the, the social media platforms hijacked, took over the, the major part of, of online journalism's audiences and sucked them into their platforms and basically t took control over that, they also took control over the major revenue stream that online journalism had, which was digital advertising. Um, and so the trouble is now that because these big platforms collect so much personal data about everyone, they can target us with advertising no matter where we go. And the big competitive advantage that online journalism had, which was we give you access to our valuable audience, which we know, and so we can, you know, we control it. That's gone now. And so Facebook and Google and, and other companies, they can target people with advertising, no matter where, because they know us, they recognize us, they know our phones, they know where we are and what we read and what our interests are and so on, without having to rely on the, the online newspapers basically to deliver that advertising. Um, and so it's the whole business has shifted away. And one of the things we were hoping from Adri perspective, because we obviously care about an independent, strong media landscape, uh, we were hoping that the DSA would reverse that development, um, or at least slow it down by basically prohibiting the, 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 the surveillance advertising business model, which is dominated by Google and Facebook, and instead say, let's do online advertising the way that that publishers are good at. Um, you know, let's take the context, which is valuable, on a, on a website like Le Monde or the New York Times, um, and let's put advertising there, but not based on personal data, which is the area where Google and Facebook always win, but let's do this based on context, which is the value that newspapers have. Um, and that was one of the big projects that we we're working on. We've kind of not one, <laughs> let me put it that way, um, but there will be limitations in the future for how much personal data can be used to target people. We hope that that's the first step and that then later on, if there's a next legislative opportunity, that we, will can, we, we can build on that um, and uh, put in place further limitations, thereby strengthening the role that, uh, that newspaper publishers have in the uh, advertising ecosystem. Thank you, Laura, you wanted an intervention and maybe you can pick up on this, you know, uh, this, this info narrative spread through, through big tech and influencing maybe of Russia and China in that regard. Sure. Um, none of us have been saying that, but uh, sometimes I get the, the feeling that we, we talk a bit like established traditional media journalism. Good, new big tech, bad. And of course the, the real world isn't like this. And. Um, I'm new to Italy, I've been only a couple of months there and my Italian is very limited, but, but to be on, honest, following the Italian TV in times of the war in Ukraine has um, 
given me a new perspective into the world into the world of, of media shall we put it this way if you're more more interested in, in, in details my, my, my boss wrote an op-ed in Politico today about the handling of the of the war in Italian media and it is rather peculiar so just to add it's an uh, op-ed of Alexander Stubb yeah uh, no um, it's uh, Miguel Poyares Maduro the chair of chair of, of Ed, Edmo um, but as, as relates to the to the tre trends of disinformation during the, the war now for the over two months the Net, fact checking network of edmo has been has been covering the very very closely on a, on a daily and weekly weekly basis the the stories being spread about about we are, have of course un, uncovered several several trends about in this information about claimed nazism and uh, and the uh, massacres of butcha not being true and and so forth and and and, and so forth one striking aspect to me has been that there are in every bad thing there is a silver lining and this feels odd to say but we've all heard so much talk about there not being a european demos about there not being a Euro european themes of discussion that unite us and frankly i don't think that's true anymore of course, we have national debates in Croatia, in Italy, in Finland, whatever. But more and more, we have the same themes and the same problems. And the disinformation no, stories are the same all over Europe. To the Eurovision Song Contest, because the <laughs> jury said once yeah. and the cities, European demo said Ukraine. Yeah. Indeed. If I may conclude with a very short an an anecdote, because I really don't want to, want to give an impression that I wouldn't value traditional journalism. Uh, having children has the benefit of, of being somewhat on top of, what's, top of what's happening in the world, even though I'm, I'm getting old. And uh, a couple of years ago, my, my son then approaching puberty and I were, were jogging. He was biking, I was jogging, and he told, Dad, do you know that the EU has banned memes? <laughs> o -o okay. Okay, how did this happen? And you know that article, I think it was article 15 or article 13, passed and now the memes will be banned. <laughs> okay, and then I 17. just... Uh, 17, yeah, indeed. <laughs> By co coincidence, I have just been uh, this, in discussions about the copyright directive and realized, okay, you must be speaking about the copyright directive. Uh, okay, Caius, <laughs> now we get home and starting from tonight, we start watching the public broadcaster evening news every night, and that's what we've been doing. <laughs> and Dorota, I would now pick up uh, on, on, on this, what we didn't have time in the last round, about your case study on this information around war in Ukraine and Poland. Do you have some you know, hints for us that you can share? Because um, we see it, you know, we can conclude just looking at it maybe, but it's better to have it as data. Sure, so let me start with saying that Poland, um, like when the um, Russian escalation of Russian invasion started, um, Poland was at the forefront of the refugee crisis. Like at some point we had over three millions um, of refugees uh, from Ukraine that basically uh, ended up in Poland overnight, almost. Uh, so, um, I would say Polish online infosphere has become an important battlefield. And therefore, uh, from the very start, uh, it has been a target of um, uh, Kremlin-led or pro-Russian uh, disinformation that very often, unfortunately, had this like anti-Ukrainian angle to it. Uh, as far as I know, the, the most prevalent uh, themes of uh, anti-Ukrainian disinformation uh, that are available uh, on online platforms currently are uh, one, um, it relates to uh, like benefit, like social benefits that Ukrainian people are getting in Poland allegedly at the expense of Polish population. So this is 
like huge thing that you know because we have so many refugees now the access to for example public health care for polish people will be limited or uh, access uh, to schools and kindergartens to polish children will be limited uh, and you know and this is like difficult because a lot of it is just in disinformation for example it, it was already proved that organic content such as for example someone claiming that they they had a heart attack but was they were not admitted to the hospital because the hospital is fully uh, taken by uh, ukrainian people these like th this these were instances of disinformation that has been like confirmed as disinformation but you know in general like we have a huge challenge with how to handle like this massive influx of 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 of, of refugees and People, like Polish people level of empathy has been also decreasing which is I suppose natural uh, also as, as war um, gets off uh, media headlines and people get back to their lives uh, and all those challenges and tensions are, are getting bigger and bigger so uh, like we are having a huge problem with that the second thing that's prevalent it's, it is to do with the alleged uh, increase of criminal uh, activity among ukrainians that's like completely not ref reflected in any like police data but um yeah but it has been quite amplified on the internet so what we were wanted to do we wanted to um so all this is very well tracked i know that there are like fact checking organizations also cooperating with edmo and they they did this report so uh we know that uh there is this information online and that online platforms are key channels through which it's spread so what we wanted to uh, check is like to what extent the current algorithms that um, are responsible for how the content is curated on the biggest platforms um, con concretely on Facebook contribute to it um, but unfortunately I do not have the <laughs> preliminary no, results no, yet <laughs> it's, it's a super uh, input and I think we could relate that to what Lauri already said uh, of the role of Edmo and the role of national hubs which are important because of knowing local environments, local context, language, especially, uh, for example, if we look at the Croatia, uh, we can here, you know, monitor all of the Western Balkans in that regard because of the language and understanding what's going on. Marianne, I wanted to intervene, but I want to also include uh, two words that, that, are, that were being said. It's health and security, as you know, this info influencing on our societies in both those uh, both those uh, uh, tracks. You work a lot on on that, on you know, the influence on democracy, radicalization, conspiracy theories, propaganda, disinformation, and what it can do to us. But just maybe you can uh, sum it up and say your point. What you wanted to react on, Dorotas? Yes, I wanted to um, basically to uh, build up on what you've just said about the basically uh, something that uh, indicates the anatomy maybe of the disinformation universes because uh, we the project profact um, which uh, i'm part of um, is very important uh, and projects like that uh, which are basically uh, i'd say being uh, encouraged and inspired also by edmo um, it's very important because it gives us, gives us really um, an insight into the psychology of the disinformation universe. And I think there are patterns and the cooperation between different projects that will point to the psychology of the disinformation universes is very important because what you just uh, mentioned is basically something that we discovered as well in our research within the Profact project, and that's the existence of the basically populist discourse which is being really um, prominent in these um, universes. And that's the basically the people against the elites, conspiracy theorists, etc. And also the existence of the dangerous others. Uh, so different groups that do endanger the domicile uh, community in many different ways. And this is the narrative that we have noticed as being reinforced um, irrelevant of the topic. So the discourse is always the same and the topics only change in these disinformation, very robust universes and uh, that we basically been examining via content analysis and social network analysis. And uh, so I think that 
looking into the psychology and the discourses of these universes is also very helpful not only looking at the at the at the basically technological infrastructure but also basically the discourse and the narrative because i think there are patterns that are very relatable across different sets of of data super input we have 10 more minutes i think we i must applaud you you were brilliant in this 45 minutes very a lot of content here uh, I'll pick again with you to start this round on we don't want to create Ministry of Truth, what Vera Yurova said, uh, and we don't want to regulate everything, but you've banned Russia today and Sputnik in European public space. So I would just like to, to, to throw it in the air and see what Mariana thinks of it, then Jan and all the others. Yes, that's that's very tricky, and that's the whole thing about uh, regulating and not censoring. So I think that's the you know when we discover how to do that, that's the holy grail. I think of this whole whole problem, and um, well, um, and, and it's not not only Russia today. It was before also with, with different Twitter accounts and uh, etc. And I'm not sure if ban is the right approach because, of course, then we uh, we have this um, again um, uh, the whole issue: who has right to ban? And the, the, there is difference, of course, because between uh, institutional ban and uh, ban, be, uh, ban being imposed by private companies. So we need to make that difference as well. So um, I'm not sure if the if the ban is the um, uh, right way to go, uh, but. Um, Yes, and yes, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, because that, 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 that's, the, that's the issue for a whole different conference, not only a, a panel, so yeah. Uh, I, I share those concerns generally, and um, I think what we also need to look at is how those things happen, um, and as far as Adri is concerned, we've been um, very worried about the, the fast track procedure that the, Europe, the Council of the EU has used um, to enact uh, this ban. There was literally no democratic debate at all. The European Parliament wasn't involved. Uh, the public wasn't involved. Uh, and, and I think this is also part of the risks that we are seeing uh, that, that member state governments basically do this unilaterally um, with very little transparency. Um, I mean, we're based in Brussels and we basically read it in the news when it was already decided more or less. Um, so it's, that's quite problematic. The DSA, uh, the Digital Services Act, will contain a um, crisis response mechanism, that's how they call it, which I believe was... Um, it will uh, have its army, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was added uh, in, in the last minute of the negotiations into the law as a response to the current situation and I believe also to make sure that in the future these kind of decisions can be taken in a, in a different manner. Um, now we've been working hard to make sure that this mechanism contains enough safeguards um, in order to prevent uh, misuse in the future. Um, some of them we got in, um, like for example the Commission can't under this mechanism, they can't just declare a crisis and you know, then they can do whatever they want, but they first need to consult member states, they need the recommendation of member states, um, regulatory authorities, um, so there will be a vote and then a rec formal recommendation, recommendation without which the Commission can't act. Um, this is one of the safeguards that we were successful in putting in, a couple of others we failed, um, so I still hope that this kind of mechanism is not going to be used in the future because the, the risk of abuse of course is always there. Uh, uh, Laura, you've mentioned that you were surprised when you moved to Italy, uh, looking at their media landscape. But con you know, talking to this, uh, uh, what just happened? Uh, should you, you know, there, there's a question: Should the journal, another journalist, give a mic to Sputnik journalist? And the other question was, you know, how do you conduct the interview with Lavrov? So these are huge questions and dilemmas that you know. Basically, the Commission intervened directly into. But, uh, okay, a lot of questions, seven more minutes. Uh, we'll start with your final, let's say, recommendations, picking up on what we've heard. Yeah. On, the, on, the, on, the, on the banning, there is no Edmo, Edmo position. It's not for, for us. And obviously, there's a, an appeal to the European Court of Justice, and we'll see how it, it goes, if the decision is upheld or, or not. If going to the conclusions, if you will, uh, 
I think many of us have, have been following the news from the other side of the Atlantic about the board of disinformation set up by the Biden administration under the Department of, of Homeland Security that has run into <clears throat> some troubles with the director apparently re resigning very recently after a, a lot of political criticism from the Republican side of the, of the political world. And I think, again, Jan was talking about learning lessons, uh, learning about mistakes of Silicon Valley. I think we can also learn about from mistakes of, of Washington, D.C. In, in this sense, oh, fortunately, the political climate in Europe is still not as poisoned as it is in the, in the U.S., and there is a huge majority in all, all European institutions and I think in all Europe, EU member states in favor of finding a smart way of regulating this information. And it's all, I think, in, in Europe, European politics, everything is about finding a balance. And perhaps the lesson to learn is that uh, sudden dramatic moves that are meant for any politician or leader to be able to show that I see I have solved the problem of disinformation. They, a, they are most likely not true, they will not solve it. Like not, not any one solution will, will solve it. We will need a very, very lar large number of different, different kinds of methods, media literacy, education, regulation, etc., etc. And B, or number two, it will most likely initiate a backlash. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I really would hate to see in Europe. Lali, Tirela, thank you so much. Dorota, please. Uh, for me, banning, um, blocking a particular media outlet is always uh, very much about addressing just the tiny tip of an iceberg. Uh, because uh, if you ban one, there are always tens of others that will basically keep uh, doing the same job. So it's always, um, like, it, it resembles very much a whack-a-mole game. Uh, you ban one, but then in this place there are uh, like many others uh, doing exactly the same thing. So for me, the, this um, made it even more clear that uh, what we really need are not those uh, addressing tip of the iceberg solutions, but more systemic solutions. And again, for us, the more systemic solutions would be solutions that give more user control over algorithms that curate content online. So for example, we had this idea to try to open uh, the market of uh, social media platforms to third party actors uh, and um, obligate platforms to allow users to use so-called third party recommender systems. So imagine that instead of being dependent on default Facebook recommender system that promotes all those uh, engaging uh, content, and me which very often means disinformation among other harmful content, you could choose another provider, external provider, the provider that you trust that meets certain criteria. For example, BBC, let's say, I don't know, like maybe you can, <laughs> you can speak to that, but it, it's, uh, it's a provider that, that um, at least I have pretty uh, like positive, um, uh, that, 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 that uh, the, some, someone who could probably create a recommender system that instead of uh, promoting uh, engaging content could promote in your newsfeed um, credible, diverse news. Thank you so much. Yeah. But it didn't happen. Just, just, just wanted to summarize that yeah. uh, we didn't uh, win on that. <laughs> Thank you. Jan, please. Um, yes, I think. Forty seconds. <laughs> fully agree with with those. I think yes, it, it needs to be a package of solutions. I think we need to say goodbye to the idea that we can eradicate problems like disinformation. We can try to reduce its negative effects. I think if we succeed with that, we're already doing well, um, and I think acknowledging that is important for everybody, including policymakers. Regulating big tech as a vaccine against this, this information, a ma mandatory vaccine? Uh. 
<laughs> yes, um, yes, um, inoculation, <laughs> right. Uh, so yes, I think what I, I, I'd like to, to, to uh, finish with that is basically I think um, we need to build the capacity and resi resilience of societies in terms of education again and media literacy. I really think that's really important. And um, also I believe that we need to be quicker because technology is very quick and really, really need to be faster. And I also strongly believe that we cannot rely on old paradigms. We cannot divide new media, old media. That's gone. That's, that's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. I think we need to um, adopt new paradigms. We need to just um, be, um, be comfortable with the fact that we live in the um, uh, attention economy, um, atten in the age of the uh, attention economy and other um, trends and phenomena and just embrace that and come up with solutions with within these new paradigms because I think the old paradigms are dead. So. Mariana Grbeša, Jan Penfred, Dorota Glovacka, Laura Tirala, it was a pleasure moderating you. Thank you so much for these valuable inputs. Please, a round of applause for our panel. Okay, it's like theater. We will have this. Uh, so, 15, little, 14 minutes coffee break, and as second panel, have two more people. I would please ask the panelists to be here five minutes earlier. Thank you. And you be sharp because we need to finish at 1 p.m. Thank you.
president. I don't know, I have to Google. Uh, in any case, we have to finish at one sharp because at one fifteen there's another Zoom conference here. So welcome to another great panel. We have a bigger challenge, or not a bigger challenge. We have 15 more minutes and two more people, so it's more or less, we're there. Just keep up the speed of the first panel. How to enhance democracy by strengthening the media ecosystem? We heard some hunches of importance of that in the first panel, but I'm very happy that we have such a distinguished panel again here. I'll start from here because they're, they're done, jump to Anna and leave the two of them at the end. So I'm very happy that I have here on my left my dear colleague, Maya Sever, she's the president of Christian Journalist Trade Union. Welcome. Um, I'm very happy that we are joined here by, I'm sorry, I always, I loved your part of Europe, but my problem of pronunciation is I apologize in the beginning. I'll try. Eva, Ivana Uskaite. Okay, thank you. Welcome from Digeres Delphi, it. Uh, Katarina Stasiuk from CWPS, which is uh, Senmo Hub, basically. Welcome, very happy to hear your inputs. Anna Bracus for Factograph, which is basically the first creation fact checker. Welcome, and also from the ProFact project, as Matt Brautovic is, who is from the University of Dubrovnik. And last but not least, Dražen Hoffman from Gong, who is organizing this conference, also a ProFact, so people, if you never heard of ProFact, 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 very important thing happening in Croatia. Thank you. So, as we heard, the health of democracy is directly connected to the health and security, I must stand, of, of a media, media ecosystem or landscape. What we experienced in years before, which was either, I don't know, financial or political pressure uh, on the media, uh, uh, how to say, downplaying the, the systemic support of citizen journalists or investigative journalists or local journalism is now basically augmented with the problem of our role of this crazy digital environment and various influences that uh, we, have, we have over that. So, uh, we now, as we heard of regulator framework uh, from regulating big tech uh, from DSA to, to code of uh, conduct of uh, this info, we also have some recommendations for media and journalists in this challenging environment. And I hope that from this panel we'll have some inputs and solutions important to look uh, in this, in this environment that we're living in. I will start with Eva, you know why? Because you're now so close to Russia. And uh, what is the challenges there? What are the challenges there? Yeah. Um, I would probably say that there are no new challenges that Lithuania faces. It's important to mention that Lithuania has faced uh, disinformation and uh, various other forms of information manipulation attacks ever since we regained our independence in the early 90s. Um, because I have to say, Baltic countries were the ones who were always talking about this info of Russia, this info, this info, this info, this info, and no one was listening or wanted to listen in that regard, and now everyone is like surprised. Sorry. Um, and it may sound scandalous, but I would say that uh, finally, finally uh, Europe has heard us and finally uh, we are all here today talking about the issue that we've been pointing out for, for the past, at least very actively for the past few years at least. Um, and so um, the landscape in Lithuania or in the Baltic states doesn't change. Uh, it basically um, is now pretty much the same as in the rest of Europe, uh, despite the fact that we always have and will have, I believe, um, active Kremlin's propaganda efforts, which have, by the way, intensified by 30% in the last year because of our uh, active measures and active policies, both domestically and abroad. Uh, however, most of the issues um, 
that are related to this information that we're dealing with are very universal and they have moved uh, from uh, Kremlin sponsored websites to to the big platforms and to the trends that we see all across Europe. Uh, I will uh, now pass to Marto maybe to, to kind of uh, put us into the frame so media in the ecosystem of this info because we are not uh, anymore a dominant force uh, of, of bringing out narratives and information as we heard. Okay, so as a part of a ProFact uh, research project, uh, we did some social network analysis and some content uh, net, uh, analysis and what we found is that uh, media in general, but also mainstream media are somehow part of this, this information ecosystem. And there is no so much research in, in that field in general, but there are some papers trying to address that problem uh, in global. And what we see is that as a result of uh, different uh, problems in journalism in general, uh, like uh, errors and not correcting errors or uh, using clickbait as a way of uh, attracting readers to your uh, content or false balance uh, as a problem of some balance as a ethical standard in journalism especially in a crisis situation like COVID-19 or uh, russia ukrainian uh, war right now uh, somehow put even mainstream media uh, to be part of that ecosystem. Uh, as uh, these information sources are regularly using mainstream media not only to criticize them, but also to use their uh, writings, even if the, the whole article is, for example, uh, correct, but maybe the, the, the uh, claims or narratives and to confirm their uh, discourses. So it's a problem uh, and I think that uh, uh, Croatian Gen Journalism Association and uh, Croatian Journalism Union and other similar professional organizations should uh, address the issue and try to help uh, journalists. Uh, we have to restart this, uh, I remember in the 90s we had so many uh, different uh, training programs for journalists and to help them to work in this digital environment and uh, to not to be part of the disinformation eco ecosystem, especially because of uh, the way how platforms operate and, in, and internet also is where rich get richer and what it means is that uh, error, which is rare, made by mainstream media will be seen far by far more people than uh, some uh, uh, content produced by some disinformation source because in case of mainstream media in Croatia we're talking about millions of followers and or in the region in southeast Europe uh, comparing to some alternative media uh, or uh, general disinformation sources with a few hundred or a few thousand followers, for example. Thank you. For now, I'll pass the floor to Karina because uh, what uh, Mato mentioned from Ievan, from one side, Mato from the other is basically uh, when we talk about how to enhance democracy by strengthening the media ecosystem, we first have to talk about what media ecosystem today is in, in that regard and this changing role of the media and the changing role of realities and what we already mentioned, you know, social media as media in the name but not media in uh, what we know as media. So what would be your uh, pickups for this discussion. Yes, I think that um, we should ask about the definition of journalism and what is even more important, the expectation of the audience. Uh, because I think, and we have some research uh, and we have some theoretical ideas about that, uh, that uh, now we see the changing role of, the journa of journalism and journalists. This is the metaphor of uh, provider versus navigator. I like this metaphor because it 
shows, uh, in my uh, opinion, very well what's going on. Uh, because uh, classical, traditional journalism, uh, journalist uh, was someone like provider of the information. Yes? Uh, so uh, the expectation of the audience was, give me some checked facts, and this is what you should do as a journalist. But now uh, it's changing. Now the, old, uh, the audience is waiting for someone uh, who will be the navigator, someone who show me what should I think, what is the best, what is important, what should I choose, uh, and in fact, what kind of way of life I should choose, yes? And some other navigators basically hijacked. Yes, them. of course. And I, when I'm talking to my students and ask them about what do you want from, from, from the media, they say not information. Maybe they even uh, have no, you know, uh, no competence, competencies to recognize the, the information. But they say, I want someone who say me, who told me what is important for me. Yeah? And I think it's a very, very uh, important change. We may not accept this, but it's happening. Talking about the change and uh, the change reality and change role uh, of the media, uh, Maya, you worked a lot on empowering journalists because we need new ideas and methods of journalism and protection of journalism on the same side. So what would be your pickup for the beginning? Uh, well, I agree with our guests. I agree also with the uh, uh, matter recommendation and uh, obligation of uh, our organization. But I think, and I will uh, use this uh, uh, situation first to uh, say that uh, from my point of view, from uh, a unionist point of view, one of the most, most important thing is the workers' rights in the journalism. We have to ensure that journalists' existential is secured. Uh, and uh, by, to, uh, uh, by that way to build the strength and independence of uh, journalism and media. And by that way, by, by uh, building uh, protection of uh, uh, workers' rights in, a journalist, in a journalism in the media, uh, we will ensure professional work uh, without possibility of blackmailing or threats or any uh, 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 other, uh, other things. Uh, journalists in all media environments in Europe are more and more dependent and their existence depends uh, on bad models of uh, co-financing of political authorities or private uh, advert advertisers. It's impossible to get out of this circle uh, without changing media ecosystem. Uh, first step should be strengthen, strengthen? Yeah. Uh, uh, the protection of journalists' labor and social rights because only safe journalists and uh, one whose existence does not depend on how critical he or she is can be professional and independent of all authorities, both political or advertisers. But, uh, for example, here in uh, Croatia, there is no real awareness in the media system about the importance of protecting of journalists' uh, rights, workers' rights, uh, uh, labor rights. Uh, there is almost such no protection in private media, no collective agreements, only two of them in public media, no social dialogue, everything is in the hands of an employer. So we have situation that those uh, who have to report about violation of workers' rights in many, of many workers in our society are not aware that their rights have been violated and they are not fighting to protect their own rights. As a trade unionist, uh, we try to initiate talks on a national level about the branch collective agreement. Uh, at least to try to protect basic level to workers uh, in, in uh, social rights uh, in the media. But it's very important, and I want to say it here also, to say loudly that there, there is a great lack of organizations uh, of media workers in the sector, 
and uh, very and uh, here is uh, in Croatia uh, lack of struggle for protection workers and social rights and this is the basic uh, for strong independent journalism and journalists which is crucial for uh, every democracy so I think that it's a beginning uh, from in this uh, struggle for stronger and new uh, changes in the media environment, not just in Croatia, but uh, in uh, our European level. And I will also put this, what you just said, under the umbrella, what Jan mentioned on the first panel, which is that we really do have systemic problems in platform economy, if we put, you know, media also on platforms. And if we look at the media, uh, as we heard uh, uh, from Katarina, as navigators that people need, or uh, selectors or contextualizers, I think it's very important because that's what we are lacking is uh, the context. We need to reclaim professional dignity of the profession and of the media because if we heard during the pandemic that journalists are worms in our public sphere, if this is somewhere in the, you know, background of some TikTok video being shared thousands of times. So uh, this relation, societal or influential relation of profession is not just degrade, you know, degrading, but it's uh, being, how to say, put out as something that we don't need if Musk is the owner of our old truth. So I think what you said is of huge importance for you know nation states in Europe still and uh, uh, European Union as such so thank you uh, for this I will pass to Drajan before we go to Anna and this relation of media and fact checking in this challenging times uh, we mentioned regulation and protection uh, Gong is working a lot on various of these uh, subjects, so how do we, uh, let's say, see the role of the nation states or Europe in fostering this kind of environments that protect journalists and that put um, dignity and importance to journalism again? Thank you. Um, well. In the sense that regulation is solving or preventing problems from arising, I think that for a number of years now it has rather been more the case that the European Union recognizes the need to uh, re introduce or reintroduce standards of regulation rather than member states. I seem to recall a number of projects warning about the reduced safety conditions in which journalists are working the public smear campaigns against journalists, the open hunt sessions that are organized by political powers and ultimately even institutional pressure against uh, media freedoms that have become government policy in some EU member states, which is a very alarming state of play. So if anything, I think that the upcoming uh, Digital Media Act and, and the very fact that media freedom and pluralism is explicitly recognized by the EU Democracy Action Plan point to a level of political leadership that uh, even EU member states as developed democracies have been uh, reluctant to take up. And even so, there is still uh, the important role as, of course, the EU cannot and will not regulate everything as we heard in the first panel, as we even heard from Commissioner Jourova. Ultimately, it is going to be uh, the public authorities in member states with the political power and the means and the responsibility to increase uh, regulatory standards, not only for the journalistic profession, not only for public support to media as a public good, but also to standards of uh, what content does or does not make it into the public sphere. And I think it's uh, high time that national regulators realize the political importance of this moment because standards are backsliding, the media market is disrupted by digital platforms and without uh, specific political action this is not going to change on its own.
In reclaiming this strength of media in these disruptive times uh, for enhancing our democracies, as uh, it is the frame of this panel, um, we live in time of fact-checking. For me, it, as a journalist, it was always you know, a strange concept. If the earth we're walking on is round, it's a fact. So how we need to check this fact. OK, we check everything. So uh, is it information checking? Is it, uh, why are you here at this point of history with us? And who are fact checkers in relations with media? Well, it's, a, it's of course a, a very big question. I think one of the reasons that uh, fact checkers were needed, and if I'm not mistaken, they first started checking false statements in political campaigns. So fact checkers right now, I think, are needed because as, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase a bit, but as uh, Maria Reza that won the Nobel Prize, uh, fact checker from the Philippines said, we no longer in many ways shared a common factual reality. It is a very, very sad fact, but it is also very, very true. So I would just like to go back to certain statements that were you know, said here. For example, I really like the fact that, that uh, Maya rose up from the individual level because I, I feel that very often when uh, people talk about the media, they go down to the, and I mean this in the best sense of the world, uh, in, in terms of they go down to the, to the workers and only talk about journalists. Uh, this situation can't be fixed if we only turn to the individual level and talk about educating journalists. We need to educate editors, and most importantly, we need to educate owners. Sometimes I think that educating owners doesn't only mean giving them information. It usually means giving them regulation. So. In, in, in many th the things that, uh, that we're talking about here, I think the, the, one of the key words that was, that was missing so far in this panel, but I'm sure we'll, we'll go uh, much deeper into it, is the levels of distrust that, that we are all uh, facing and that we are trying to fight against. I think we're sometimes even a bit too harsh on our audiences and we fall into the logic of the big tech platforms and we say that we are going to call our you know, citizens users and we keep using that uh, terminology with it, which is pretty bad, I think. Um, but to circle around to what, what I wanted to say is I think that the audiences that we are talking about actually want more information. And I, I'm not saying that just because it's something that I think. Uh, Faktograph, as a, as a fact-checking operation, decided to listen to our audience as much as possible. Uh, just last week, we realized that in the last two years, since the pandemic started, we have received over 850 requests from people to fact-check certain claims or statements. And this I would just- citizens, but it's important. That's for, right, yeah. that's right. And I would just like to point out, and then I'll, 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 I'll uh, wrap it up for this round. Uh, I would just like to point out that we realized that even though we are receiving a question from an individual, that individual is always concerned about the group. Is it a group of friends? Is it family? Is it some other way uh, that, that, is it some other group that they are trying to get arguments for in order to, to help them communicate what they think uh, is important. And just to be a bit braggy, uh, out of the 850 something questions that, that we got, we, we responded to over 50% with written articles. And uh, for that reason, I think our citizens have a real need to get really good information. I completely agree with you. There's a need. Uh... 
there is not many communication of the problem from the state actors. Uh, you know, NGOs are maybe at some point, everyone knows of you, so we know here who to address, but a lot of people don't know about, you know, some Edmos or whatever who exist out there to, to kind of find solace in, this, in these times. So, and of course, you know, the health and the strength of our democracies is different in various parts of Europe, as well as media ecosystems and landscapes. So maybe, you know, media picture and workers' right in media sector and journalism rights are different in Finland or Baltic states than in Spain and Hungary and in whatever, Netherlands than Croatia. So these are also things we need to, uh, uh, think about, talking about this. Uh, Eva Delphi is biggest, the largest yeah, or online news organization in the Baltic and you did some practical, I cannot call it exercise because it's a huge work that you did uh, on uh, this information uh, phenomenon uh, which is also being weaponized not in the space of democratic life but against us as media and journalists. So what did you find out, you know, what came out of it? And you wanted to refer something to something that Anna said also. Yes, so first I would like to refer to what Anna has said. Um, um, well, I think that uh, uh, your question about what fact-checking is and why do we have a term like that uh, is First of all, because we live in a very disrupted informational environment. So uh, when we think about uh, a term like that, which basically shouldn't exist because everybody should know what a fact is, uh, it means that something is wrong. And to add on to what Anna said, not only uh, journalists, not only editors, not only uh, owners have to be educated, but I think that it's important to remember that we live in this very complex ecosystem where every single stakeholder is coexisting together, influencing one another. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, uh, there is an audience, there's an audience who can become uh, information distributor as well. So this is where we, I think, need to think about careful re regulation. And what I wanted to point out is that in Lithuania, just very recently at the beginning of this year, we had a law enacted uh, that was um, directed towards influencers who have more than 50,000 followers. And so those are subject uh, to uh, um, income taxes, first of all, because it is, um, a, uh, an activity uh, that they live from. And another thing is, of course, accountability according to the journalistic standards. So all media organizations support it very highly. Uh, however, the, there was a lot of public debate about those who conduct um, sort of journalistic investigations uh, that would take longer and they wouldn't be able to respond in time. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that happened. And then, uh, yeah, and then um, coming back uh, to your question, I think that, uh, well, Delphi, over the past few years, Delphi has initiated at least five different initiatives uh, related to curbing disinformation activities. So those were uh, fact-checking related activities, media literacy related activities, and the most recent one, Digiress, um, is something like ProFact. Um, and I think this is where we have to focus on and where we can have a new beginning. Because um, I would like to refer back to what Laura has sh said during the first panel, is that um, it is impossible to do something on your own, even though you are a news organization. You can experiment with content, see uh, um, to which types of content audiences respond the best. You can try to look for new channels of content distribution so that um, uh, platforms don't steal that much of audience away from you, so you can utilize those platforms for your own gain. But the most important thing is that we have to, um, again, remember, 
uh, that uh, we are part of the ecosystem and we must collaborate with different stakeholders, with institutions, uh, with uh, mm, global partners that have best practices to share with us, with academia who can provide recommendations, and then and only then uh, we may be able to, to have some shift uh, in this problematic area. In terms of uh, remedies, what we talked prior to this panel, Katarina and Maya, this question is to both of you. Uh, this, what Eva just said, these are these basics on our way to recovery on, on, or maybe uh, strengthening not just media ecosystem but media and its role in democracy if we want to prevail. Democracy as such, that's another question. So um, what would you pinpoint as uh, these most let's say, important things for us as journalists, medias, and media workers, which both Maya and Anna uh, emphasized that earlier. Yes, I think that the most important point is uh, media literacy and education. Because what I said before, and I was I wanted to stress, was that this is the expectation of the audience. I don't think that it's you know, good for, for the journalist profession that people are looking for, that the audience are looking for, for someone who uh, who will help them with the orientation of the world, because I, in the world, because I think that maybe we should uh, remember the audience, if I may say like that, what, uh, uh, what is the importance of uh, information in the society. Because uh, maybe people get a little bit, let's say, lazy. It's easier to get the interpretation of the world than the information and then you have to think about it, you have to check, you have to make decision by your own. And it's, yes, it's too much work. So maybe we should start from the education, not maybe, I'm sure we should start uh, from the education. And referring to the fact uh, check, uh, checking, let's say, I think that we are witnessing the birth of new journalism profession very important, but from my point of view, maybe yeah, it's a little bit controversial, I don't know, but I think that uh, fact checkers community should be a little bit closer to the journalist community, should be the part of, uh, of the journalist environment, you know? This is because sometimes when, when I'm talking to journalists and fact checkers, I feel that they are quite apart from, you know? Uh, they, they, Sometimes even I feel they, they think about say like about some uh, competition I don't know something like that so from my point of view it's a big problem also. Maya Benana. Yes. Okay. So so I will also add a protection of their workers' rights <laughs> is a very important step. Yes. Yes. I, we, we agree. And maybe I, I could just say a few words about the also importance of professional organizations as a union but as association. Uh, because yes, 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 yes. But uh, I think that the, all, all, also from a position to uh, speak up and fight uh, uh, when the people, journalists and uh, workers in the media cannot, uh, do not arrive or do not have time or uh, necessary knowledge when we talk about education. Uh, so uh, we are here to try to organize uh, uh, as we agree, uh, education, but we also need uh, help, funds, and uh, and uh, some uh, stronger mechanism, support mechanism for those activities. And uh, we are here to speak loudly for them. Uh, these uh, organizations are also in uh, this new media environment uh, are needed to strengthen the network of cooperation uh, and support between journalists and other medias and organizations, which is uh, uh, really very needed in these uh, times. Professional organizations uh, today work on uh, several levels, uh, from uh, this uh, direct assistance to the journalists in daily cooperation, advices, legal assistance, uh, a consultation with relevant institutions, education, concrete uh, uh, help, sometimes uh, help in uh, everyday uh, journalist situation, for example, when they are attacked unusually, uh, unfortunately also in Croatia, we're witnessing that uh, 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 more and more journalists uh, 
were and are attacked not just online, but uh, even on their uh, regular jobs, so for example, reporting from protests. Uh, it's, uh, this is physical, but do we yes. also have this kind of, I've mentioned this, pandemical uh, slogan, yeah. worm, journalist worms. Yeah. Uh, we also had the other day, our colleague Hrvoj Krešić, who was the journalist of the year, he's been addressed to, he asked the question to our prime minister, and the prime minister asked, are you normal? Openly, and all the, you know, whole full of journalists yes, you opened kept the their mouth shut yeah, no, when yeah. the prime now minister open... said that kind of sentence. Yeah. Yes, but we also have uh, so many examples of uh, when a president attacked journalists yeah, yeah. and insulted yeah, that's them. That's why I'm saying yes, political power. Yeah, that's, a, that's a big problem in Croatia, and uh, we don't yet know what to do with that, but that's uh, really some new perspective that uh, authorities, people on the power, attack journalists, insulted them. So, uh, yes, but we are also here for them to try to protect them, to try to uh, report about these uh, attacks, uh, even uh, to our colleagues on European level, you know, we are always included in uh, those uh, all activities, uh, also like uh, rule of law or uh, I don't know what. Uh, and um, we are here to try to help our journalists, our colleagues uh, who are under pressure of uh, slap lawsuits. It's also a very big problem in Croatia. Uh, or when it's, uh, or, or regularly when it's necessary to provide some uh, financial material on advisory assistance. Uh, uh, organizations are also important to, uh, for influencing uh, media policy on this national level and on European level. So what I want to say that in this uh, uh, new media environment, these problems we are facing, uh, uh, I think that our organizations are also very to important. Be strengthened. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And what you are doing, which I have noticed, both Syndicate and the Croatian Journalist Association, is connecting, you know, yeah. European colleagues and us, and I think yeah. it's more and more and more relevant. Anna wanted to intervene. I mean, I can I can just uh, sort of uh, piggyback on the on the last comments. Uh, I mean, um, harassment is of course a very important issue in the fact-checking community, but also in the in the whole of media. Um, just yesterday, I was preparing for some uh, some some video for a conference held in Sarajevo that I couldn't go to and had to like film myself doing the speech. Anyway, I, I went through some numbers that we had and, and had, a, had a realization that in the last two years we wrote around 600 uh, uh, fact checks on misinformation, a bit more, uh, on misinformation relating to the pandemic. In the, in the same time period, uh, we reported around 50 very violent or death threats to the police. Uh, I mean, you can do the math on the number of articles and the number of uh, reports. Uh, the number of uh, the threats that we actually reported are, I don't want to lie, but we, we really, really filtered through them. So probably around, I don't know, 10 or 20 or something like that percent uh, from, the, from the things that we actually see. Um, so it's a, it's a really, really important issue. Uh, slap suits are, are a pretty big thing in Croatia. If I'm not wrong, we are at the top of the European Union with the, with the number of lawsuits. A couple of those uh, lawsuits are aimed at Faktograf uh, and fit exactly into the mold of being sued by either politicians or very, very well-off individuals. Uh, we even have a case of a criminal charge being filed against uh, the editor-in-chief and myself personally and being questioned in a room you know, for, for criminals and waiting to see if the in indictment is going to happen or no. I know it's a, probably a little bit of a pessimistic segue uh, into, into something that I, I really wanted to answer to. So first of all, I think because it's rather new, fact-checking and the fact-checking community is fairly often seen as a very monolithic community, while it's uh, very much the, the opposite is actually true. There are as many different approaches or, or way to setting up your uh, organization or operation that uh, like there are many different types of media in general that, that, that can you know, focus on specific things or uh, specific fields or issues, whatever. Um, but I would agree that 
we could create at least two big, let's call them, uh, schools of thought in the fact-checking community, where one is uh, basically saying we are journalists and fact-checking is at the core, at the heart, whatever you want to call it, of journalism, and the other ones that is, that, that, that is actually saying it's not the same, let's call it like an additional thing or something like that. In Factograph's case, which I think is fairly visible uh, from the moment you, you like go onto our site, uh, we think that fact-checking is journalism. Everybody that works in our organization uh, calls themselves a journalist. Sometimes we add journalist and a fact-checker, but it's, it's like a, the primary identifier. And uh, just to wrap it up, one of the ways, one of the reasons why we think that is so important is because what we try to do in our media organization it, it is not just to focus on the, on the, on the, on the, on the. We try to focus on the underlying issues that are actually creating this atmosphere where uh, we, as a people, are so susceptible to misinformation. So parts of our site are very much dedicated uh, to in-depth analyses and to, to research and to try to figure out uh, what is going on and where, where is the good information hidden. Not just saying, you know, this is wrong. I only, sorry, I would like to ask that uh, this community also is doing very good educational job. You know, with, with this showing the uh, journalist investigations, the way, the tools, etc. I think it's also very important. And it's important who will take this, you know, as, uh, yeah, Eva and Maya, and then we go to the boys. Okay, um, I think it's very, it's all very on point. Uh, because what I think is important, and I would really like to agree with you, uh, is education and uh, media organizations uh, can become not only, uh, I'm not speaking of uh, fact-checking right now, but of media organization as a whole. So media organizations uh, have to shift the mindset from being just a news transmitter or fact-checker in this particular case, uh, but rather educator um, about what a fact is, if needed, uh, to the audiences, and then also uh, to the rest of the community, because there's one interesting thing we found out while conducting the DigiRest project, was that uh, regional media, smaller media organizations in Lithuania, uh, they're, they still don't understand uh, the complexity and uh, vastness of an issue such as disinformation or the, this, the necessity to fact check. Uh, we were conducting training to them and they didn't show that much of interest as we thought they should. So it is also very important to speak within the community and to communicate the message across, to let everybody know, not only uh, the audiences, but also to smaller partners, to freelancer journalists, uh, that first of all, you have to know that this is important and this is where media is going inevitably. I agree, I agree, really. And I think that we also have to work together on that. But I would like just to add that uh, uh, one of most important of our common task uh, should be to provide a strong protection system for journalists and for media workers. We are, uh, we as a union and association uh, uh, participating in the SLAP workshops, we try to uh, open dialogue with the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Uh, but um, we also work on uh, like uh, some kind of uh, pressure to implement faster implementing of directive against SLAP and recommendation on a national level. But it's very, very important and it's, uh, we need more than that. Uh, not only in Croatia, but on, uh, on all European level in other countries, uh, we have to fight to establish a protection system, system very strong mechanism to, for protection journalists. 
because uh, it's really important for all of us, fast response on the attack, online and uh, 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 real attacks. I think that it's also uh, should be one of our common tasks. Cooperation with institution and, okay, sorry. No, no, uh, boys are waiting, but I have, want to pick up on something that Lauri said when your son approached you and said, ah, they're going to, you know, ban the memes. Um, and you said that you went with him and watched public service TV news. Europe has this legacy of public TV service. Someone mentioned also BBC previous. They're not in our boat anymore as EU. Uh, but I think that if you have such kind of mechanism that penetrates every household in this country, I can say, I don't know, in other European countries, but public service, TV and radio, fight. I worked almost 20 years on our public service broadcaster and I still think it's a fight that needs to be fought and if you want to change the course of society, you know, why in um, fragile states people always uh, break into TV studios? that was before, now they have this, you know, digital platform. So I just want to put it somewhere out there in the space for discussion in Europe today, especially in these parts of the world where we have huge, huge political influence uh, on our public service, unfortunately still. So from what Anna said, uh, distrust in media, I don't want to say traditional media or mainstream media, I hate those terms, but in media, uh, journalism being, and journalists being basically targets of this information or content of this information because we saw what campaign was being out there against Factograph in recent time, what we see, what's going on with, you know, certain journalists, as our colleague Danka Derify, what she's experiencing in the question of now abortion or whatever, you know, hardcore topics that she was dealing with. Uh, so how to exercise this rebuilding of trust in media and what everyone mentioned, media literacy. How to exercise and wear media literacy in digital chaos, not to be such some super niche for getting more money. <laughs> okay, we are so eager to answer your question, we couldn't agree on who would go first. <laughs> well, he spilled coffee, some bad moment. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, media literacy has been apostrophed by Karina as being the, the absolute uh, groundwork that you need to prepare an audience uh, to set the scene in, in a cultural way to, you know, adapt media audiences to be receptive of information as democratic citizens, to be resistant to disinformation, and so on and so forth. And this is the kind of approach that is very much touted uh, uh, on a declaratory level, but as you mentioned, uh, public service broadcasters who are in the perfect position to do so are on the one hand perhaps the primary, I suppose, um, beneficiaries or maleficiaries of, uh, of platformization. I think that, if anything, the creation radio television, which is the, pub the public broadcaster in Croatia, is an example of a house that should have gotten with the times. And I, I know I'm probably the least qualified person to call for this with Maya Sever sitting right here in the panel. But so many tools are at the disposal of the so-called traditional media that uh, it's a shame that it's only left to a select group of journalists and editors who recognize the importance and the public accountability of quality journalism and are willing to speak out for it. So there is really no longer the luxury of siloized work to be, uh, to be accepted as, as the mode of work. Uh, fact checkers work on, rampant, on combating rampant disinformation that stems from pandemics. Academics will produce this sort of fundamental or applied research into the nature of disinformation, and regulators would just rather, you know, stay away from it and not, not cause too much of a ruckus as trends unfold driven by technology and driven, driven by, uh, 
market forces. Of course, media literacy and media education is, an impo is important, but it needs to be viewed as a tool, not as, as a tool in a box, not just as a sole, um, sole approach out there. And uh, we do everyone, uh, uh, we would do everyone a service by, you know, uh, taking all of the inputs in this spoken of in this panel and, uh, you know, pit them against the initial question of rebuilding trust in media. Before I leave a floor to you, I want to add one question to Mato, uh, because uh, if we see big tech or social media or whatever the am as amplificators of bullshit as the, their business model, and our business model as journalists and, and media is uh, uh, something that Katarina was saying, you know, context analysis, understanding putting information into context bec because without putting information into context there's no uh, educated electorate and media were uh, how to say invented to have informed electorates in democracies so uh, what will be your pickups on where to start here to clean the mess okay so i think th the biggest problem in general approach regarding this information and uh, the problems that we have with m media ecosystem is that uh, we are using solutions from 20th, cent 20th century uh, to fix the problem from 21st century in general. Uh, I don't think that... Uh, we should think like Xi Jinping in centuries. Yeah. No, no. And, uh, I believe in the uh, form of self self-regulation, not regulation on the state level or international level. Uh, I believe that uh, media literacy is not just something that we do with kids in the school or in high school, but something that we should uh, have programs for older people because they are in the center of this information. Uh, I don't think that uh, economical reasons are explaining why some journalists are behaving how they are be behaving and what the, the bad routines and practices they are uh, applying in their work. Uh, I, I can't give you the, the right answer, you know, how to fix the problem. But what I know is that uh, the platforms or tech companies are 10 years in front of us in general. And uh, solutions like censorship, like uh, controlling, like uh, limiting, like, are not solution. Period. Uh, and I want to ask you, because you're very active also in the academic research and, you know, in, in uh, uh, Profact, we heard experiences from Katarina and Ieva concerning the creation context and broader context of the region of Southeast Europe. Uh, do you think and why do you think this kind of hub will be important to be established in Croatia? Uh, first of all, it will join different parties together to fight this information. You know, uh, because we have very even on an ac academic level, we don't discuss uh, about the, these problems, and you know, that's the only way how we can find possible solutions for it. Uh, we don't do enough research. We don't uh, do uh, media literacy programs enough. Uh, we don't do trainings for journalists. Uh, we don't, you know, think about it. And I think the hub will somehow uh, help us to put all these efforts on one location and make some synergy from it to, giantize to understand different the problems mm -hmm. and uh, to pr I hope find solutions for some of them how did it empower you both you know creating such hubs we heard some experiences but in, in, in this regard and you know how were you more resilient for example to this point where we are now in complete you know chaos of influence? I can begin because our project is smaller. 
Uh, so we're basically a playground and a sandbox uh, in Lithuania. Actually, <clears throat> starting this project has added a little bit of confusion into the paradigms that we already knew and to, into the perceptions of how we initially saw uh, the process of curbing disinformation activities. So what I can say now that we're on a good path uh, to designing the most efficient ways to collaborate because first of all, as I mentioned, uh, we realized that it was um, not a matter, like this, this whole issue, um, uh, this information um, uh, and resilience to it uh, is basically a societal issue that has to be dealt by including various um, partners with different organizational skills and different experiences. So um, we have to find the most efficient ways how to collaborate so that in order to, uh, uh, by doing so we would be able to deliver uh, the most adaptable strategies that would eventually have some impact. Right now what we have uh, it's still the very early beginnings. I would say that starting the project is already a good beginning of doing things in a different way than we used to. Okay, um, from my point of view uh, in Edma activities uh, are two main points. The first one was mentioned that we are cooperating uh, in uh, free environment scientists, uh, journalists and fact checkers and also educators. And I think this is very, very important. And also uh, important is that uh, the project is international because uh, because uh, disinformation is a global phenomenon. And I think we, st we should still remember that. And the plan is that first we would like to research the disinformation to uh, using the scientific methods uh, to get to know as much as possible and then in cooperation with professionals, uh, we would like to design some educational activities for, oh, we say, every group of society, of course not for every, but for ve very differentiated groups like teachers, parents, also journalists, but what is, uh, I think, uh, some kind of experiment, and I'm waiting for it, because we would like also to, to organize some, uh, some kind of educational activity for teenagers, uh, using, for example, influencers, and also uh, designing some serious game, because yeah, the idea is that maybe it's the way to get to them, and maybe it's something interesting. When I'm observing uh, my 16 years old son, uh, he, he loves the app, I don't know if I may say it's a geo, uh, sorry, I forget it, the, the app where um, a geo guesser. It's something that you have to, uh, you, have to you are in the point uh, somewhere uh, in the city or somewhere you don't know where, in fact, in the earth, and you have to check, you know, to check the buildings, to check the names of the streets, and he loves it. And I think if we can show uh, young people that, that this is the kind of investigation, in fact, you know, this is the kind of uh, fun, you know, but not critical thinking. They don't want to hear about critical thinking, you know. <laughs> the, but this is some kind of fun, you know. You have it, you like it, you do the same like fact checkers. Of course, it's easier, you know, but the mechanism is the same. I saw somewhere in the audience, I cannot pick him up, a super, there you are, Rieka scientist. Uh, I want to, no, no, I won't ask you to say anything, but uh, your work is very important. How important do you think is technology and, uh, you know, these new solutions that help what we heard from Dorota, you know, in understanding algorithms, in penetrating this, you know, dimension that are creating chaos in our minds. So how do we include technology in, in all of this that you were saying, Anna can start and we can. Uh, well, I, I really like the fact that you just decided to ask really easy questions uh, to, the, to the whole group. Uh, 
Well, uh, my, I'm advocating that uh, ideas for the new times that are in front of us of Europe can come from this part of Europe. I am strongly advocating this in every field. Okay, so I, this is the beginning. I think there is a, I don't know what the situation is in, in other countries that uh, are represented at, at this panel, but in my opinion in Croatia or even in the whole region, there is a huge gap. Uh, I would even call them like data voids in knowledge about new technologies, especially uh, in our languages. So the topics, a lot of the topics that we are mentioning here are really not new. They are out there and they are uh, getting to the front and center of the political debate uh, year by year. Uh, so the, the questions around uh, algorithms or questions even about the biases that are, you know, uh, um, basically built into algorithms are pretty big questions. Uh, and I'm sure that I won't, you know, say something that's completely new uh, at this panel uh, that hasn't been said before. But just to kind of uh, concentrate on our own context, I think it's really important uh, to, to try to understand that uh, when you use platforms, uh, the world is being basically curated for you. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we, in, in many ways, have uh, so many shared, uh, not shared realities. Because, uh, and it's something that I, I think, um, there are of course like very good examples of trying to fight that, but I, I saw recently that a pretty, like a big media organization <laughs> basically decided to try to do something like that. And it's, it's not the same, but it's like, we're gonna choose, you know, eight, uh, eight links, uh, eight, eight uh, you know, like uh, titles uh, that we think uh, are important and then we are gonna present them to you and we are gonna say, this is the news uh, that you need. Uh, and I think some of those, uh, some of those um, ideas have kind of uh, gotten into the, the media uh, landscape even though we didn't really want them. Uh, and as I said, this is not something completely new, but I, I really hate the fact that newsletters, especially uh, in media, are advertised as, this is everything you need to know. Apply to this newsletter, get your morning brief, you're set for the day, read this and carry on. It's completely crazy. Especially when you present yourself, you know, as a media that is, that is trying to broaden uh, the way that people think or broaden, you know, like our uh, approaches to the world. Uh, yeah, I'm starting to get a bit too uh, philosophical here, but that's, that's what you get when you ask about algorithms and are not a programmer, so I can't go into the... But I think we yeah. also need philosophical thinking in times of this and understanding that our uh, philosophy in uh, this country or uh, in you know closer environment is uh, corruption and the strong, strong connection of someone mentioned media owners with politics, with what Maya mentioned, the existential threat basically to, to journalists because you know you have such low wages and concerning the economic situation. You Sorry, know, and the complete lack of uh, funding for non-profit media, which course, focuses so, on and completely the, yeah, yeah, different topics. Funding yeah. is in any case, yeah. non-profit media or you know investigative journalists or whatever models that are appearing here and there. And I think this is, you know, if you talk about strengthening media ecosystem, it's the, we are really under existential threat at the moment. So I will just maybe give a first pick to Drajan then to Maya to, to comment on this. I don't know how is it, you know, and you're part of Europe, but I would also like to hear, you know, is this kind of thing helped you to fight it or you have some other situation? Please, Drajan. Um, I think that the first thing to mention is that any attempt to substitute journalism as uh, as a profession or as an activity of public interest so far has either failed or been instrumentalized for political or commercial purposes to to the extent that it can no longer be called journalism in good faith. There is simply no alternative in either educating the public, in regulating big tech, 
uh, in investigating this information, in uh, conducting inoculation of the population against uh, this information, projects like EDMO are probably the best attempt that we have right now to interlink these areas, but simple uh, public support for journalism and the reintroduction of journalism as the activity uh, contributing to public interest is uh, simply a must. And if you have, you know, globally parallel realities of which Mariana spoke, you know, two truths which cannot come together of Breitbart and, I don't know, New York Times, whatever, it's, it's really, you know, huge, huge challenge. Maya? Well, you opened so many problems and uh, there is a lot of problems uh, here in Croatia, if you want me to talk about Croatia, but uh, everything starts with uh, weak, poor medias. And uh, those medias, uh, most of them, uh, depend of uh, political will and uh, financing by uh, political authorities, not just on a local level, but even on a national level, because we have also one uh, a bizarre circle that, for example, with the European money, uh, government and uh, official uh, institutions uh, uh, paid uh, this uh, work package uh, for visibility of European uh, big projects uh, for uh, media they uh, choose, and that's also circle. You know, you can't expect that uh, this media will uh, uh, publish something against, in, against these institutions or government or media. Uh, because uh, our economy is uh, so big, there is even no enough uh, uh, advertising for uh, uh, real financing media. Uh, we have problem with the public media. We probably uh, hear in this uh, in this whole know about it because our public media is under political uh, control and pressure because there is no uh, independent way to choose uh, general management and. Uh, other uh, uh, yeah, bodies within them. Uh, neither program council is uh, uh, independent, but also in Croatian media environment, we have a really, really big problem with independency. We don't have any regular body uh, or agency for media uh, which is real independent because all those uh, uh, um, general managers or leaders of those uh, agency and regulatory body uh, uh, has to be elected in a parliament by political majority. And of course you asked the question about the importance of the technology. Uh, it's. Uh, of course, uh, extremely important, but uh, in our media sector, it also becoming a problem with us. Uh, uh, we just talk about it uh, without support. Our weak and poor medias uh, or newsrooms don't have a strength or funds uh, to educate journalists, uh, to educate and train them uh, in these new tools uh, uh, which we need for fact-checking uh, and uh, to implement them. Uh, so, uh, probably our roles as organizations should be important also about this problem, but we also have a, the same problem, lack of funds, and uh, I hope that maybe even this conference uh, will be an opportunity to connect better with uh, people, with the colleagues from Europe and the colleagues from, uh, I don't know, Dubrovnik, and uh, to look for some better solution for all of us because you know i think that the uh, weakness of our media environment is uh, is a problem for uh, all those things uh, we talk about here i would like to hear also that from eva and uh, katarina about you know how t how strong medias or journalism scene is <clears throat> as i briefly mentioned before it always depends um so first of all, we have strong independent media in Lithuania. We have um, Internet Media Association that Delphi is part of. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, many smaller news organizations that are not progressing uh, the way the market is. Uh, so I think that there, there might be one solution to that. Um, um, Okay, so let's say, let's draw a parallel to a rapidly changing environment um, evolution in medicine. 
right? Um, doctors need to renew their licenses every few years because they need to learn whatever is new uh, in their field of expertise. Uh, most of uh, most of media professionals uh, do it um, because of their pure own interest, right? And others uh, that don't see a need for it, they stagnate, but they still carry uh, the name of credible accredited uh, media organization. So that's that's a question for debate. Maybe they need uh, some sort of uh, compulsory uh, compulsory training in whatever is new uh, in publishing standards, whatever is new in technology. Um, and then on on the other hand. Um, institutions should enable that. They should provide resources and funding uh, to be able to do so because uh, I think uh, probably most of the people would agree with me on this panel that um, uh, financing uh, for dealing with these issues is very unstable and if we want something that works and if we want something that has impact both on media organizations and eventually then on society that uh, reacts to whatever uh, media organizations is providing to it, uh, uh, then we need some sustainability in that field. Uh, generally speaking, I agree, but it all depends, of course. Uh, referring, for example, to the situation in Poland, uh, I would like to be very, I, I think that uh, it's very risky to talk about some kind of, you know, uh, national regulatory system uh, because uh, Polish government is very engaged in media. And in fact, public media in Poland, uh, uh, especially uh, television, is in fact the tool of governmental propaganda now in Poland. So, and it's very, I think it's very risky and we should be very careful with this, with this uh, state apparatus. And also, in my opinion, of course, the idea of licenses, let's say, yes, it's quite nice, but the question is always the same, who will do it? Yeah? And you will have to have a very strong and independent professional organization, really strong and really independent. And I think it's very, very difficult. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The centralization, yeah. that's yeah. always so. there. And we see, you know, these trends. You mentioned Poland, Hungary. We, we mentioned several examples here in Croatia. So, you know, we have this trend in European polis politics that is. A, a the polarization of media system, yeah. media landscape, yes. Yeah. Media landscape. So, we have 15 more minutes. Well, well, six of you. Um, where do we pick from uh, today, Mato? Thank you for a very specific question for me. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about that coffee that you spilled. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> okay. Uh, obviously, it wasn't my best morning in that case. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Maya, for saving me <laughs> regarding that. Uh, this information is obviously a huge problem in our societies. And mainstream and, and media in general are part of that uh, problem, at, e at least in Southeast uh, Europe. Uh, we have to be proactive in solving the problem, but I don't know how successful we will be regarding that, especially because we have these uh, non-national actors or international actors that are quite involved in spreading of disinformation and misinformation in uh, our uh, region. Uh, Fact-checking is one of the solutions. We should have more fact-checkers doing that more organizations on national or even regional level as our disinformation ecosystem is uh, regional, not national. Uh, also, the journalists or uh, media should have dedicated 
uh, uh, parts that are doing fact-checking. There should be partnership between fact-checking organizations, independent fact-checking organization, and uh, media, uh, where media should uh, help them promote the, 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 the fact-checks they are producing. Uh, we should conduct media literacy campaigns as I already mentioned, not just for the kids, but also for grown-ups. Uh, there should be, some things should be regulated, for sure, but there should be even stronger self-regulation between media organizations. Because uh, you all heard about Dennis McQuayle, this uh, famous uh, professor from the University of Amsterdam who wrote this uh, mass media communication theory book all students of journalism and communication science, etc., media studies, etc., uh, learn from this book. He was also writing about media accountability. And what he said in, in his writings and his research uh, was that if self-regulation fails, a uh, regulator took over or will take over. Uh, I think self-regulation should be the direction that we should go for the big tech, but also for the media. And also uh, about financing uh, the media in, 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 or now in Croatia or in the region. Uh, there are solutions, you know. Uh, we should prevent or we should forbid governments from local to national uh, level to finance media. And we should have, for example, a Scandinavian solution where uh, citizens are actually voting how, uh, which media will be financed and how much and for what kind of projects. For example, that can be a solution for the uh, issue. And then we will have independence and no influence from the government side or the politician side uh, how it's... Uh, m m maybe this is ideal model and can't be achieved uh, in any way. But obviously the, the media industry needs help. Advertisement is not the uh, source that can be provide self, uh, sustainability for long term. So there are solutions over there, but we have to be proactive in that, in that way. And I think the, the, the conference is like this, panels like this, more deba debating about the, the problems that we mentioned uh, today can steer us in good direction and probably we, could, we can get public support for some of these solutions and then maybe we'll be able to fix the problem that we are right now talking dealing about, with. Talking about public support because public we are here for public and some say public needs us also this is to discuss in which sense but for another time um, politicians need public voting rights and we see decline in interest in politics in terms of that in more or less all European countries we have you know 50 percent of people staying at home during election process and we see that, you know, people breaking out with traditional politics is bringing more authoritarianism in, Croatia, is in European politics as such. And we see huge successes on the elections of peace, of Orban. Uh, will public or people or audience uh, accept this reinventing media as their new educators and contextualizers in time of uh, breaking free into this freedom of masks and TikToks in time of this cognitive dissonance. I don't know who can be Katrina, and then we can go to Anna, and the last yeah, round to finish this up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, as per usual, Mato and I uh, disagree, disagree <laughs> uh, which is sort of a common theme. Uh, <laughs> yes, so, 
uh, especially on the part of just expecting platforms to self-regulate, but more importantly on the, the way we should fund uh, media. Because I think it depends uh, whether you see uh, the, the job that we are doing, you know, as journalists, is it, is it something that we are doing as a public service, as a public good? So, in my head, it's very much related to the question that you asked. Uh, I don't understand why uh, legacy media organizations, even in Croatia, should expect huge levels of trust when they don't actually trust their own audiences that they put their trust and accountability more towards advertisers or the state. They have no expectations from the citizens uh, in this country other, for, other than for them to, you know, throw in a couple of kuna to buy the newspapers, and that's it. Uh, so for me, uh, the question is not why don't the citizens trust them, it's why should they? There is this level of acknowledgement that I think it is necessary in order for us to do a better job. And if we keep pretending that the people should trust the media just because the media is supposed to be good, we are, without actually looking at the facts, we won't be going, you know, anywhere. And just another sentence, because I think it's sometimes for this region uh, also a very common theme. So fact-checking in this region uh, has, uh, has been, it, it, ha it has been here for years. It, it started in, 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 in this region way before it started in many other countries around the world. Uh, the C-Check network that we created two years ago as a, as a, like a more of a formalized and structured network currently has six organizations from five countries. We constantly work uh, with fact-checkers from our region. We share knowledge. We do joint analyses, we write articles together, and we keep uh, trying to uh, put pressure on anybody that is willing to listen uh, so they can understand that uh, this information doesn't care about our you know, national borders here. The language is the same. And they need to consider that uh, when, we, when we talk about this information uh, in this region. Thank you so much. Six oh. more minutes, Marco. Draghi. Marco disagrees. No, I agree with Tana. <laughs> oh my Thank God! You. <laughs> An applause for, for us. Uh, okay, sure. Um, yeah. In conclusion, uh, again, this uh, this kind of sequestering since. It, this this was actually a great introduction to my thought. The borders between uh, understandings are increasingly blurred, and it's with complete mutual intelligibility of languages in the region, with a very unified uh, information and disinformation context, uh, the borders are no longer really an issue. And honestly, the borders between methods should follow suit. Where this information has been so successful in using every possible channel to piggyback off uh, mainstream media, to sell itself off as, uh, as uh, legacy media to, uh, to the public, to sell itself to tech platforms and so forth, a coordinated response is actually the only way. Support for journalism, and I'm absolutely uh, on the side of public funding here, sorry, but I, uh, I, I honestly don't believe in, in the willingness of audiences to support media for a variety of reasons, but I do believe very much in the need for media to be reaffirmed as a force worth funding in addition to all the other methods recognized as part of EDMA program from uh, fostering media literacy to conducting research and so forth. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that we are coming back to the problem of professionalization of journalism, yes? Because if we would have professional journalism, they could demand the trust, yeah? Yes, but we, but we don't have them. In fact, and for uh, a good example, if there's, is the example of investigative journalism. Uh, for me, very important example, so-called example of so-called so serious journalism, and in fact, it doesn't exist. In Poland, uh, journalist investigations are uh, founded by 
uh, by the community of people, by the private people. You know, we have something which is called Oco Press. And they have money because they fundraising them via social media. And they are doing the most important journalist investigations in Poland. So I think it's some kind of, you know, uh, coming back to the basic things, which is education, but also the professionalization of journalism. Thank you so much, Katrina. Very important. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I would say that the audience is, well, the whole society won't accept any change as a natural thing. Uh, and uh, my idea of the concept of change and changing role of media can be described in six words. Uh, everybody has to work hard. And the sixth word is together. So uh, everybody has its own role, its own expertise, uh, media. Um, okay, so let's start with institutions. Institutions want uh, want to have um, credible media. Um, institu uh, both private and public institutions. They want to have credible media that would assume a role of an educator, right? Okay, so if media were to be an educator, they would need uh, to know the way on how to best conduct this educational process. Here comes academia. Academia can provide relevant research that would provide recommendations both to media on what is the most efficient way uh, to educate the audiences and then later to the institutions uh, what policies have to be adapted so that everybody would be on the same page. So, and it all needs financing so everybody needs to understand that uh, it, it doesn't come from nothing so uh, in order to gradually step up and in order to gradually have uh, Brazilian societies that accept quality journalism as a norm and uh, discredit actually those that are bad actors uh, we, we need to work hard together Okay, despite small disagreements, I hope that uh, on this panel we all agreed that fight against this formation and fight for stronger media environment is a fight waged by people, by journalists. Strengthening protection of journalists, uh, strengthening their knowledge, educating journalists, but also ensuring a serious protection system is our common test. Regardless of uh, different centuries, I hope that we have agreed that uh, strengthening journalists' protection, their capacities, uh, and uh, are the basis of the uh, beginning of start of this struggle, and I hope that uh, we will continue. East Europe, space of ideas. Thank you, people, you don't know how much. Maya Sever, Eva Ivan Nuskajte, Katarina Stasiuk, uh, Draja Hoffman, Mato Brautovic, and Anna Brakus, how to enhance democracy by strengthening the media ecosystem. I'm an optimist, uh, even though it's hard, but looking at you, you know, there's some force. Uh, thank you, Gong, for organizing this in the crucial moment for Europe and for us, and, you know, let's lose these cognitive dissonances and go straightforward to our uncertain future with the confidence. Thank you, Ariana, for and your team for this. Thanks. Thanks, guys.